Thank you for being here. I've been asked to abbreviate this so that uh, my presentation will not eclipse your looming lunar event. <laughs> yeah. So when I announced my candidacy to run for Texas State Senate, a number of secular groups asked me to uh, talk about what it's like to run for office as an open atheist in one of the most regressive, uh, reddest, conservative Christian Republican re religious right reactionary southern states otherwise known as the Bible Belt. And as bad as that sounds, it means that I must now also talk about my political position before an audience of atheists. I don't know if you've ever experienced on social media what it's like to share your opinions on socio-political matters with a bunch of atheists. Just because we agree there's no God doesn't mean we agree on everything else, and if we disagree on anything else, we will be sure to let you know that. <laughs> Despite all the religion bashing that I get on my channel, or that I do on my channel, I don't get hate mail from believers. I only get it from other atheists. For example, uh, one time, I made one video, years ago, where I described myself, I thought pretty clearly, as a second wave or equity feminist by the modern terms that people feel necessary to use. And I described what that means to me is that I think that unfair double standards should not be arbitrarily imposed on the basis of gender. And I thought that was pretty clear and concise, easy to understand, and nobody would argue against that. But because I identified with the F word, every video I uploaded or that had my name attached to it for four years after that, bore comments to the, the effect or, or accusing me of being an extreme, radical, third wave, regressive, irrational, SJW cuck, <laughs> worshiping the cancerous religion of feminism. And, as if that wasn't bad enough, it, it, this is not about uh, equality, it seems, according to my detractors, but the feminism was really, secretly, uh, it, it was all about misandrists dominating us poor, uh, dis, uh, disadvantaged men. And uh, my detractors somehow think all these, all these pejoratives apply to me. And that I think it's an awful lot of uh, wild-ass assertions since I never said anything to, uh, to support or validate or indicate any of that at all. Why are we so polarized? We take everything to an extreme dichotomy of hyperbole. And for another example, uh, without any nuance, it's all completely wrong. Um, for another example, if I think that the only reason that government exists at all anymore is because it has some few jobs to do out of some minimal responsibility to its citizenry, then the anarchists chime in to tell me that I'm a state theist, <laughs> that I worship the state, that I believe in big government and I'm probably communist. It doesn't matter that I'm actually anti-authoritarian and that I actually want a smaller government than those on the right who pretend to want that but who really want the state to legislate everything going on in our bodies and in our bedrooms. Thank you very much. And then there's that whole left versus right thing. I, I, as I understand it, you have conservatives on the right who are longing for the good old days which should make them regressive, right? And then you have progressives on the left, right? And because they're yearning for the future. And liberals are supposed to be the middle ground, at least according to the political compass. But now you have conservatives calling themselves or uh, traditional or what is it, uh, classical liberals, while otherwise everybody in the conservative South hates liberals for being leftists. So I can't tell what the hell liberal is anymore. And regardless what you may have been told about the left, I am left of center myself, and uh, I have never considered myself a victim. Instead, I empathize when I see bad things happening to other people. And my own life uh, has been pretty sweet, all things considered, although a lot of that may have to do with my having a positive attitude. Which means, of course, that I don't hate anybody either. I may be outraged by injustice or dishonesty, and I may be disappointed if I'm insulted by someone I respect, but that should not impact my respect for that person. And I've never been offended otherwise. Honestly, I can't even imagine what it's like to be offended. So I don't know how anybody figures me for a social justice warrior. There seem to be multiple definitions of that, and some of them do not apply to me. But you understand that if I run as a Democratic candidate, 
then human rights, advocating human rights, is kind of part of the job description. So even if I didn't care about anybody but myself, I'd run as a Republican. <laughs> now I have to admit the caveat that I know that there are a few good Republicans, not all Republicans. Just like there are a few bad Democrats, there are rare exceptions exist on many sides, many sides. <laughs> and I hear an awful lot of demonization of the left. Have we forgotten that that is a, uh, whoop, that that is an economic axis? Being opposed, as I am, to corporatists and to the very idea of the Federal Reserve, as Thomas Jefferson was also, forces me to be on the left because I value human rights above the rights and profits of corporations. Someone appropriately said that I'll believe that, a corporation, that corporations are people when Texas executes one. <laughs> I live in Texas, which has twice as many uh, executions than the next most lethal state. But I don't support the death penalty for a number of reasons, one of which is that it's barbaric. And we're... <laughs> And this is what frustrates me about some other people on the left giving up the moral high ground to add to the hatred and vicious attacks that I used to usually only see on the right. Like this thing in Charlottesville where neo-Nazis were trying to unite the right, which I think means to unite the religious right with the alternative right, neither of which has a reputation for benefiting humanity as a whole. So right-wingers brought guns and shields while leftists brought cudgels and clubs. And if you bring weapons to a protest, we should assume that you'd intend to use them. If you bring non-lethal weapons, then I think you're there looking for a fight without a felony. I went to Standing Rock last year before Trump was elected and all hope was lost. <laughs> and the Native American trainers there were, were training uh, the volunteer water protectors not to go meet the police at the front line with anything that looked like it could be used as a weapon because that might incite a lethal response. Understand that, in my opinion at least, and I think, I hope it's shared by everyone here, lies and violence are both abusive uh, and despicable acts which are possibly excusable only as a last resort of desperate defense. And. Um, if you bring any kind of a weapon to an already charged public demonstration, then you don't understand your right to peaceful assembly. You're doing it wrong. So in this highly de uh, divisive environment we lived in now, I have people say that I agree with everything or 90% of everything that you just said, but there's that one thing you said that I disagree with, and so now I have to hate you forever and campaign against everything you ever do. Okay, but that's not how I am. Your politics don't have to be mine, mine don't have to be yours, and I will not disregard or disrespect any possible ally just over some relatively trivial difference of opinion, uh, just, or because they voted for a crazy person. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, and some of the, my enemy's friends are my friends too, which means they should be reasoned with, usually. Just so you know, within the atheist community, there are people who voted for Trump who are not only still my friends, but some of them are even helping with my campaign. There is even a Christian Republican Party delegate in Texas who's a dear old friend of mine and he wants to help my campaign too, even though I'm an atheist you know, running as a Democrat. Because one thing we still agree on is that the establishment of both parties needs to change. And I understand that things... Thank you very much. I understand that things do change. I'm aware of the, the Southern strategy and how Democrats and Republicans effectively switched platforms at some point in the 1960s. So if this were 50 years ago, I would have been a Republican then. And I've never identified as a Democrat before, but uh, if you're running in Texas and you're not one of the two main parties, you're not gonna get on the ballot most likely and I need all the help I can get. It's bad enough that I'm running in a largely rural district uh, full of religious fundamentalists and that the odds would still be against me even if I didn't look like a Klingon Disney villain. <laughs> I 
I realize I'm supposed to kiss the babies and not eat them. <laughs> but everything is different now. Look at Steve Hill. I don't know if you know Steve Hill. He's a six foot five uh, black stand up comedian. He, and he ran for the California State Senate and got, still got 20% of the vote, even as an open Satanist. And that tells you there's a substantial proportion of the population who are less afraid of the devil than the people who are already in charge. <laughs> I predict, and this is sincere, I, I predict a significant improvement in the image of atheists by this next election. And I'm already seeing that starting to happen. When I go to California, uh, New York, uh, Washington State, I don't, they don't understand why there are so many atheist activists so charged up in the South. But with the Trump-Pence administration now affecting us nationally, I think they're starting to figure that out because they're seeing what we've been putting up with in the Bible Belt for so very long. And my strategy is that after a couple of years of ultra-right-wing religious Christian dominionists dominating everything at every level of federal government and the majority of most of our state governments and every level of my state government, that people are going to want something a little bit more moderate, maybe a bit more to the left. If I do nothing else in this election, I'm going to drag this district to the left because it can't go any further to the right. <laughs> We'd have to go a long way to the left to get back to the center. The incumbent in my district, who will be my opponent in this election, is as far to the right as he possibly can be. He describes himself as a Tea Party believer, and his priorities are to build that wall and to make sure that trans people can't pee. <laughs> He's too far right for most Republicans, and I'm seeing a lot of division there too, you know, where I'm finding moderate Republicans, I'm finding people who are willing to listen to me, the freak, rather than the guy they originally elected. And I realize that no one's really going to look at me and call me a moderate. <laughs> Let's just say it's never happened before. But that's to my advantage, and I'll explain why. In my immediate vicinity, there are a couple dozen Republican senators and one or two Democrats. That's how offset everything is. In the last few elections, Republicans in my district have run unopposed. I was the first Democratic candidate in this decade. Imagine going to the ballot box and there's just the Republican and nobody else showed up. Now, and there was a primary in the last election where these two Republicans are running against each other. And one of them accused the other of not having paid his taxes back when that mattered to Republicans. <laughs> and the other responded by saying that my opponent is inspired by Satan. That's the Tea Party believer that I'm going to be running against. So we live at a time that Christian fundamentalists can accuse each other of witchcraft. What are they going to say about me? <laughs> Admit it, you want to see that political debate, don't you? <laughs> However, my campaign platform is not about nor relevant to my position on religion, except perhaps that no one is a better defender of the First Amendment than an atheist activist. The U.S. Constitution states in Article 6, Paragraph 3, no religious test shall ever be required for any office or public trust in the United States. But the Texas Constitution says in Article 1, Section 4, no test shall ever be required as a qualification for any office or public trust in this state, nor shall anyone be excluded from holding office on account of his religious sentiments, provided he acknowledge the existence of a supreme being. <laughs> the case of Torcaso versus Watkins overrules that. Sections 6 and 7 read that no man shall be compelled to attend, erect, or support any place of worship or to maintain any ministry against his consent, nor shall property belonging to the state be appropriated for such purpose. Our Christian con uh, congressmen consistently ignore that part, but I'm going to hold them to it. Not only do we defend freedom of religion better than any Christian organization, but we also understand freedom of speech freedom of press, and freedom to peaceably assemble, to air grievances against our government. These are things that are not understood by many of the right, especially in Texas, where they seem to have forgotten that there is another amendment before that second one. 
Let me tell you how bad it is in Texas. They tried to pass a law prohibiting Sharia law, not realizing that the First Amendment already does that because they don't read the First Amendment or they don't like it or they want to ignore the rest of it because they also want to write a bunch of laws uh, promoting Christianity. And Rick Perry signed a law that would have the effect of outing teachers' religious beliefs to their students. And when he signed that law, he, uh, he expressed a, a, a message that I'm certain was directed at me when he said that freedom of religion is not freedom from religion because he was opposing a message that was quoted in the newspapers by me as the sole voice of opposition to that bill. We've already seen how the GOP are pushing laws across the country that limit both our, our speech and our assembly while demonizing the press. Yet they pretend to defend the Constitution, just like they defend the Bible, when they don't seem to have read or understood either one. The almost exclusively Republican Congress in Texas is a villainous regime, but a lot of their constituents seem to be waking up to that. I went to a rally at the state capitol where Republican speakers admitted to everyone that in order to fix the problem, they were going to have to be prepared to put aside party loyalty and vote for members of the other party. Note, Texas Republicans think that they are born into their party and that they owe it somehow an allegiance. This is an attitude that I, doesn't, I don't think appears in any other political party in any other country that I'm aware of. Republicans at that rally said that they would only vote for someone with a strong record of support for public education, and in my district, that's me. However, incumbent legislators criticize education advocates as educrats. This is because our Republican Congress hates public education. They cut the budget by $4 billion in 2011, effectively chopping it in half, which means they laid off half our teachers and overcrowded our classrooms, yet they keep cutting it even more. And the way they do that has the peripheral effect of raising our property taxes, which also goes against their expressed values. By 2020, the state's education budget will be millions in arrears and billions uh, in uh, the red just a couple years after that. At the same time, they've been pulling for vouchers to route money away from public schools and to charter schools, which can't be regulated or, and are subject to corruption. Or the money goes to private schools, which were almost exclusively religious and actually teach the Bible as the only source of truth in our world, advocating the idea that the whole of reality could be dismissed as a lie or an illusion. Neither private schools nor charter schools have any legal obligation to provide for students with disabilities, nor low-income students either. Both can legally discriminate against any pupil for any reason. And that's not all they've done to public education. In 2012, the Texas Republican Party platform actually said that they are opposed to critical thinking. <laughs> Specifically, the platform read and I quote, they are against any higher order thinking skills that might challenge parental authority or threaten a student's fixed beliefs. Just think about the notion of having fixed beliefs that must never be challenged. That statement got a lot of bad press, so it doesn't say that anymore, but it is still implied. The Texas Republican Party platform still says that they want to teach theories of origins as if they were questionable. And they're not just talking about abiogenesis, evolution, cosmology. They're also talking about anthropogenic climate change because remember, Texas is an oil state and nothing can ever threaten the fossil fuel industry. This isn't about any eternal God, but the, is limited only to the myopic God of profits for the next fiscal quarter. And remember that even when the polar ice caps melted for the first time in human history, there was no admission that this was evidence that global warming or climate change was really real. This was dismissed as God opening up new opportunities to drill for oil. <laughs> Texas injects counterproductive religious nonsense into every classroom, whether it's science, sex, or social studies. We have history books teaching that Moses was a real person that he was born some 3,200 years ago, even though that is only a faith-based belief, and those believers can't agree on when he was supposed to have lived. Our history books even imply that the United States Constitution was based on a covenant between God and Moses. 
They held doggedly onto abstinence-only sex education such that some high school students didn't even know that sex causes pregnancy. Consequently, for years, we've had the highest rate of repeat teen pregnancies of any state in the country. This, the Republicans made even worse by restricting access to any means of birth control and minimizing or eliminating any programs that would have benefited unwed mothers with infant children, thus expanding the divide between the haves and the have-nots, such that a third of Texas children now live below the poverty line. The goal appears to be to eliminate the middle class, which would make my state the equivalent of a third world country. Think how different all of that would have been if we taught sex ed, provided birth control, and at least helped out those few remaining students who didn't pay attention in class. We'd be much better off, but under the rule of the religious right, the maternal mortality rate has doubled, such that more mothers are dying in childbirth in Texas than in any other developed nation. We could have fixed all that. We had this heroic state senator named Wendy Davis. In 2011, she managed to save a billion dollars from a substantial budget cut in our education, and a couple years later, she had herself fitted with a catheter so that she could hold another filibuster uh, to preserve or you know, to defend women's reproductive rights, and she was successful in that. In that. But our then governor, Rick Perry, held a, special, a second special session just to push through his restrictions anyway. And when Perry signed that bill into law, he referred to it as an honor to women. On the same day, he also signed his 500th execution order, and it was also a female prisoner. So Perry is this horrible villain. Um, no, seriously, this guy's bad news. The very first thing he ever did as governor was to store toxic waste in an aquifer that fed four states. And then when Texas chemical plants failed inspections, he deregulated them so they wouldn't have any inspections anymore. And the result of this was that two of them exploded, one of which in a suburban neighborhood. So Perry had delusions of adequacy <laughs> and decided to fail a second campaign for president, leaving the position of governor open. Meanwhile, Wendy Davis ran for governor and could have won had it not been for all the people whining that your vote doesn't count, don't contribute to a broken system, protest by abstinence, as if rolling over in submission, complicit submission, serves as any kind of protest. But one thing, yeah. One thing our last presidential election did was wake a lot of those people up. And they say, well, what, you mean if we don't vote, this is what happens? Because whenever there's low voter turnout, Republicans always win because they tend to vote as a bloc, just like their pastors tell them to. Even without the Johnson Amendment, they were already illegally, illegally running as lobbies. And now, without the Johnson Amendment, those, super, those mega churches have become super PACs. And to give you an idea how bad that is, there are over 90 mega churches in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex alone. So we elected a new Reich of the religious right, and the Texas economy dropped from third place to 21st place, while Texas tuition has risen by 147%. We're now 46th in the nation for education and 49th place, only behind Mississippi, in states that accommodate people with disabilities. And so what are the priorities of the Republican Congress in Texas? And it seems to be the perpetuation of prejudice. There's very little that constituents can do about that because Texas legislators suspended the rules for public hearings and even posting bills that are to be presented, so you have to go and see for yourself. The last time I was in the state capitol, um, they, they were pushing a bathroom bill which judges everyone's gender expression. It didn't pass, so I'm not going to go into the morose details about it. This would have required everyone to carry their birth certificate to prove that they're using the toilet of their original sex. And one of the things that somehow these congressmen did not immediately see was that if your emo cousin or son you know, doesn't swagger with the, you know, the bravado of somebody compensating for sexual insecurities, or if your aunt looks too much like Mrs. Doubtfire, they better both have their birth certificates on them to prove that they're using the right bathroom. And how embarrassing is that? If you had a child with special needs 
and it's a different gender, you, one of you is going to have to break the law to go in the wrong bathroom. It, law that wasn't a problem before. Then there was the show your papers bill. And this allowed racial profiling by police who would doubly serve as immigration agents such that anyone who might look foreign in any place, walking between classrooms in your campus, if a cop looks at you and thinks maybe you don't belong here, he could demand that you show your papers of naturalization and immigration or be arrested on the spot if you can't prove you belong here. If these bills had passed, Texas would be just like the old Soviet Union, and the only thing that's missing is our version of the Berlin Wall, and the Republican Congress is trying to do that to us too. This while continuing to criminalize marijuana for the sake of our largely privatized prison system, which can't make a profit otherwise. We don't have the kind of crime rate that would justify having 5% of our population in prison. The United States has more of uh, its percentage of its population in prison than any other country. And one out of five of those prisoners is in Texas. And that's just part of the problem. We're also disproportionately convicting black citizens. They may only be 12% of the free population, but they are more than three times as many blacks in prisons as there are whites. And these statistics uh, indicate a systemic prejudice. And I have to explain this for the people who tell me that blacks are committing all the violent crimes. That's not true, but even if it were, blacks are stopped and detained more often than whites, and they're statistically more likely to be convicted and serve longer sentences than whites for the same crimes. And I have to repeat that because nobody ever catches it if I write it down in social media. I said, for the same crimes. Most of the time, we're not even talking about violent crime. We're talking about drugs, usually marijuana specifically, which is not a crime in a growing number of states and shouldn't be a crime anywhere anymore. <laughs> Everyone knows that blacks aren't the only ones smoking dope, right? Okay. They're just the ones being busted for it disproportionately. And despite what some might judge based on my appearance, if marijuana were legal everywhere, I still would not partake. I just don't happen to enjoy it myself. I've tried it, I didn't like it, so what? But the data is in. And every state that had, where marijuana has legal is, uh, has reaped a huge amount of revenue and seen their crime rates drop and their suicide rates drop. And if we did this across the country, this would also kill the drug cartels to the south, where, the, where Trump's cost prohibitive and pointless wall does no good at all. And that's one reason I'm running, because I'm neither a bigot nor an idiot, because I understand opposing explanations and I can extrapolate ramifications all on my own better, it seems, than many of our current congressmen. And I'm running as a Democrat because it seems that the solution to so many of our problems is to do the very opposite of everything the GOP wants to do to our education, to our economy, and to the environment. Everything they propose only complicates, compounds, or causes the problem. And I know the odds are against me, but one other reason I'm running is now, the, the one reason I'm running now is also the reason I became an activist in the first place. When evangelicals were, were telling me 20 years ago on Usenet, I mean, bragging about how their churches had lobbied together and everybody voted the way their pastors told them to, and they've elected certain judges and certain senators in key positions so that they could have this culture war that they imagined they were having. And at that time, many of these people were, uh, the, the people they were electing were from the Chalcedon Institute, following R.J. Rushduni's Reconstructionism, and they wanted a government that would enforce Levitical law. And we're so close to that now that it's way past time for secular candidates to jump into politics and turn that tide. And Texas already has a religious freedom constitutional amendment which allows religion special privileges and even exceptions from the law or programs applicable to everyone else. So I, uh, I had to do something even though it meant getting into politics. And I knew that getting into politics it would look, for me, to get into politics would look like a freak show. But then Kid Rock jumped in too. <laughs> and there's a couple of guys who look like me who were running for office. There's a guy who looks like a Viking biker. His name is Thor. <laughs> he's a drummer in a rock band in Austin, and he's running for governor. And there's another guy, another gubernatorial candidate, who runs a gay bar in Dallas. Uh, he's running for governor also. His name is Jeffrey Payne, but he was most recently uh, nominated or crowned 
international Mr. Leather. <laughs> so, I, I, can you imagine that president? This is the buttless chaps governor. Both of these guys are in the news, but I'm not. Why? When Justin Scott called some of the newspaper reporters and other agencies to try to let them know about me, there was one that he reported as an example of the kind of response he was getting. Uh, he said that there was one group that, or one newspaper that was interested in telling the story of a Democratic candidate for the first time in like 15 years or however long it was, until he mentioned that I was an atheist activist. And then the door slammed shut with the explanation that we're never going to run a story about an atheist. Our readers are Christian. And Jamie Farron, another atheist activist in Amarillo, told me that he'd asked a panel of state senatorial con uh, candidates how they would represent their unbelieving constituents. To which there was a bit of confusion as all of these senatorial candidates looked at each other and you know, confused and then finally answered back, our constituents are Christian. So it's like we don't even matter. We don't even exist. So uh, as uh, Eddie Tabash and other speakers I think have already implied, it's way past time for all of us to consider running for office because if we don't, we could be running for our lives. Thank you very much.